To close this section, we're going to talk about what is, to me, one of the most beautiful applications of electrochemistry, and it's rooted in a deep appreciation of the Nernst equation and the way we can use the reaction quotient to modulate cell potential. So if we zoom in on the Nernst equation here for a second, one thing to notice is that even if the standard cell potential is zero, it's still possible to achieve a non-zero, non-standard cell potential by changing the value of Q from one. And this is the basis of a special type of galvanic cell known as a concentration cell. And that's the topic of this video. In a concentration cell, we have two half cells with equivalent components chemically. So for example, copper metal and copper two plus are both present in both half cells. This means that the redox reaction that takes place is degenerate. The products are identical to the reactants. And so the practical setup would look something like this, with copper metal and, and copper two aqueous on the left-hand side, and copper metal and aqueous copper two on the right-hand side. Completely degenerate. And in that case, the standard cell potential is equal to zero. We'll see why this is a little bit of a different way here in a second. And the value of the equilibrium constant for this redox reaction is equal to one. And this is because delta G naught, the standard free energy change for the reaction, is equal to zero. And yet, we can still get a voltage to appear across these two half cells, and we can still get current to flow from one half cell to the other. How do we do this? Well, what we want to happen, essentially, is for copper in the left electrode to be oxidized to copper 2 plus, giving up two electrons. And we want those two electrons to travel across the wire through an electrical load and down into the other half cell, the red half cell, where copper 2 plus is reduced to copper. So we want that left-hand electrode to serve as an anode and the right-hand electrode to serve as a cathode, for instance. And I'm using the red and blue coloring that we've used throughout our discussions of galvanic cells so far. So how in the world do we do this? Well, if the concentrations of copper two in the two half cells are equal, then the situation is hopeless because Q is equal to one. This would be, for example, a galvanic cell in its standard state. And with Q equal to one, there's no driving force for electrons to flow one way or the other. However, if we ensure that the concentration of copper two plus is greater in the red half cell than it is in the blue half cell. Well, now we've created a situation where there is a driving force for reduction of copper two, since the two concentrations of copper two in the half cells are not equal to each other. This creates a situation where the value of the reaction quotient is not equal to one. So there is a driving force for electrons to flow from the left to the right. And this will occur until those two concentrations equalize, at which point we are truly at equilibrium. And so the reaction quotient under these circumstances is less than one. If we think through this, in the anode, we have a molarity of, for example, 0.1 molar. And in the cathode, we have a molarity of copper two of one molar. So Q in this particular case would be equal to 0 0.10. That's less than one. And this creates a situation, if we circle back to the Nernst equation one more time, where with the natural log of Q negative, because the value of Q is less than one, I've got a positive cell potential, right? Even though E naught cell is equal to zero. That's the beauty of concentration cells. One thing to note here, finally, before we move forward, is that the half cell with the greater concentration of copper two plus, or the oxidized metal cation typically in a typical concentration cell, is the cathode. This is where reduction would like to occur. This is where nature would like reduction to occur because the concentration of copper two plus oxidized ions is, is higher in that half cell. And so electrons will spontaneously flow toward that greater concentration of copper two plus ions to consume them in order to equalize the copper two concentrations in both half cells at equilibrium. Just how much voltage can you get out of a concentration cell. If you think about it, the, the experimental setup here is absurdly simple, right? And it seems very sustainable and very green. Instead of using four different chemical substances, I'm using only two, copper metal and copper two plus. If we could get a lot of voltage out of this thing, this looks like a very, very promising battery, for example. And so let's get a sense of that with this practice problem. We're asked what is the cell potential of a concentration cell described 
by the cell notation below. And let's take it back to our understanding of cell notation to appreciate what's going on here. To the left of the double vertical bars, we have the anode. And here, zinc metal is being oxidized to zinc 2 plus, and the zinc 2 plus concentration on that side is 0 0.10 moles per liter. To the right of the double bars, we have the cathode, where zinc 2 plus, at a concentration of 0 0.5 moles per liter, is being reduced to zinc metal. And notice, the molarity of zinc 2 plus is greater in the cathode than it is in the anode, and this is what provides the driving force for a voltage, for a cell potential in a concentration cell. So here's the balanced redox reaction. It's entirely degenerate. Zinc reacts with zinc 2 plus to form zinc and zinc 2 plus, and I've just color coded the zinc and zinc 2 plus and the cathode and anode red and blue respectively. Now, we know from working with the Nernst equation in the past, and we're absolutely going to need to work with the Nernst equation here since we need to think about the reaction quotient and its effect on cell potential. We know from working with the Nernst equation that we need to get a sense of how many electrons are transferred, and it's pretty clear here to see that two electrons are transferred from the zinc zero to the zinc two in this redox reaction. And so the value of n is going to be two, and we're going to need to use that when we apply the Nernst equation here. All right, so here's the Nernst equation, and I've written it out in symbolic terms, as well as this sort of mathematically nice form that happens at 298 Kelvin with 0 0.0592 volts divided by n times the natural log of Q. And notice here, I've left out the standard cell potential term. Why is that? Well, this is a completely degenerate reaction with delta G not equal to zero and E naught cell equal to zero. So the standard cell potential is zero. We need the value of Q. We're going to need to plug that in to the Nernst equation. And here, keep in mind, in a functioning concentration cell, the value of Q is less than 1. Q is less than K. This is what causes the reaction to go forward. And so the value of Q is going to correspond to the molarity of zinc 2 plus, that should say, in the anode, divided by the molarity of zinc 2 plus in the cathode. And this comes out to 0 0.2. 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.5. We plug that in to the Nernst equation in black above, and we arrive at an E naught cell value of 0 0.021 volts. It's about 21 millivolts. And to calibrate you on this, that's about a sixth, a seventh, maybe about an eighth of a AAA battery. So not great. Not a ton of cell potential you can get out of a concentration cell. Um, in essence, it takes a very large value of Q to get an appreciable voltage out of a concentration cell. And when Q gets very large, or very small, I should say, it takes a very, very small value of Q, much, much less than one, to get a, work, a useful working voltage out of a concentration cell in most cases. And when you get to very, very tiny values of Q, the ideality built into the Nernst equation starts to break down. And so they're not that functionally useful, but they're a great application of our theory of the chemical thermodynamics of galvanic cells.